Okay, everyone, thank you again for coming back and watching chapter this video on chapter 11. Share my screen. What we want to talk about today is going to be with reference to forecasting. These are some of the things that we're going to be discussing today in this particular chapter as it relates to forecasting. And forecasting really is about making decisions, how we can make those decisions, decisions based on the man, whether what we think will happen in the future and uh, developing our plans and how we will respond and what we think should happen in the future. And really forecasting is, again, um, one of those inputs into the business planning and control both inside and outside the organization based on uh, the demand or at least what we think the demand is going to be. And it really is associated with the ability to forecast, looking at what process designs that may need to change, what capacity we need to be looking at, what's going to be our inventory management strategy, and to scheduling of our much um, scarce resources, whether it comes from uh, marketing, sales, manufacturing, human resources, financial resources, all of it comes together to look at how we go about doing our day-to-day -day operations and in doing those day-to-day -day operations to ensure that uh, finances, our accounting practices, our human resource functions are invested and deployed correctly to ensure the long time, the long term survivability and our profitability of our particular organizations. And as such, as we think about the use of some of these forecasting decisions that you see in table 11.1 .1 on page 254, gives us some different types of forecasting for operation decisions and how we go about that from a time horizon, time horizon, accuracy required number of forecasts, management lead times and the forecasting method. And when it comes to marketing finances and HR, again in table 11.1. .1. So in general terms, qualitative forecasting methods really rely on management's judgments, their experience, their exp expertise, what they have seen in the past and not uh, so much specific quantitative methods. They certainly are useful when there's a lack of data or when past data that we are used are not likely predictors of what we think is going to occur in the future. So all of that is associated with what do we do, how do we go about doing it in such a way that's going to ensure the success of the organization. Equally important, when you think about quantitative forecasting methods, uh, there's typically two types, time series and casual, or, excuse me, casual forecasting, which we'll get into a little bit later in this particular discussion. Uh, and the basic assumption for all quantitative forecasting methods is that past data and the data patterns are reliable predictors of the futures. And again, we'll talk about the time series and the casual forecasting methods here shortly. But again, table 11.1 .1 on page 254 is where this information on operational decisions and use of forecasting and some of those concepts are being discussed. So when we think about quantitative forecasting methods on page 255, again, is utilizing managerial judgment, their experience, any data that they may have, any math, many mathematical models that they may have. Uh, quantitative measures certainly got to be, to me, balanced with the quantitative because you don't want to disregard someone's experience, expertise, and their best judgment. But in part of that, uh, both, both of these, or excuse me, when you think about qualitative measures on table 11.2, 11.2 on page 256, they describe four different types of forecasting methods. Delify, market surveys, life cycle analogies, and informed judgment. All of those 
uh, are very good in both informed judgment and the Delphi method use expert opinion to arrive at a forecast where informed judgment is usually done by a panel, a group uh, who will come together and discuss the forecast and arrive at a consensus. One of the dangers associated with that certainly is that um, if you have a dominant player on that panel or board does not give way to other members who are maybe not quite as vocal to have their voice heard. The Delphi method was kind of developed to correct this. It consists of several rounds of anonymous data collection before a, reaching a forecast synopsis. Another method discussed in table 11.2 on page 256 deals with the life cycle analogy. And this method is used on the idea that the product of service demand has an S-shaped curve. And to gauge that shape of the curve uh, is usually drawn from an analogy with a similar product or service. And when you think about informed judgment, it is just that. It is the informed just judgment or the native models where forecasts and total sales of individual projects are, are looking at. And you see in that table 11.1, which uh, short-term the accuracy standpoint, short-term, medium-term, long-term, identification of the turning point and the relative cost and some of the uses. So uh, understanding 11.2, reading that is, is uh, certainly will add um, another tool to your management toolbox when you think about qualitative forecasting methods. This figure here on page 257, figure 11.1, .1 really goes into this thing called time series forecasting. And time series forecasting is used to make a detailed analysis of past demand patterns over time. And we can use those patterns to help us predict demand moving to in the future. One of the basic assumptions of all of these all-time series method is that demand can be decomposed into components such as level, uh, average level, average trend, seasonality, cycle, and random error. And again, we see that in this particular figure 11. Point one at the bottom of page 257. The level is relative, relatively constant, um, constant average demand during a time interval, whereas the trend is an increase or decrease in the average demand over time. Seasonality is a regularly repeated pattern of increasing and decreasing demand in the cycle is either increasing or decreasing demand over long periods of time. Um, and these cyclic demands may be due to changes in the overall economy or changes in the product service or life cycle or any other multitude of, of changes or, or reasons why they may change. Random error typically reflects the short-term fluctuations that cannot be forecasted. So the basic strategy used in a time series forecasting is to identify the magnitude and the form of, of each component on the basis of the availability of past data and then looking at that and making the appropriate calculations. This particular formula here, the simple moving average and the weighted moving average you'll see over on page 258 and 259. And uh, when you think about the terminology, you're looking at the demand forecast during a time period of T and the forecast demand for T plus one time period where the demand minus the forecast error in that period and the average component computed in some period of T. So you see that discussion over on page 258. Uh, one of the simplest methods of time series forecasting is the moving average method. Uh, there's no seasonal pattern, trend, or cycle components that are soon to be present in the demand. And it's really looking at the uh, average number of, of um, 
periods, periods signify by n, where the weight is given the, the weight associated with that particular demand. And we see that again over on page 258, where the most F is the most recent period of demand included in the calculation. And that's a key piece is understanding how these weighted averages will work. Again, uh, you see that over on page 258. And in figure, excuse me, in table 11.3, where you see at the top of 259, we see a three period moving average that is used for forecasting. That is used for forecasting. And we see the beginning of that in this particular slide here of table 11.3 over on page 259. And it's looking at the most recent periods of demand. And this table 11.3 provides a three period moving average period one, two, and three, so that we can use that to predict or forecast what we think is going to occur in period number four. So the forecasting that we see here is taking the actual man of, of the 29, which is the most recent, plus 18, plus 10, divided by three, and that's going to give us our forecast for a period number four. Uh, so that's what you see. That's that's basically how this calculation is working. And if you look at table 11.3 again, uh, you're going to use that table, excuse me, as an illustration of using that table, starting with period three, how we can predict in the period four, using period four, how we can predict in the period five, and all the way through down to period 15 is the way that is working. So it, it is pretty straightforward. If you follow the data table, the math is relatively easy. But 11.3 is a graph, excuse me, is a data table that gives us a representation of the concepts of the moving average. This is a time series data figure that you see at the bottom of uh, page 259, which shows the demand data from the example of the three moving period average in a six period moving average. And it graphs that for you graphically so you see what that looks like. And then going over to page 260, where we talk about exponential smoothing. But before we get into exponential smoothing, please take a look at the weighted moving average where depending on how we weight uh, the demand, there's typically more weight that's placed on the recent demand than the earlier one, which is called the weighted moving average, where you see that uh, page 260. And let's see, this is the weighted moving average formula here that we see on page 260. And it's looking at the given weights again to the one that's most recent uh, to the one that's the oldest. What is the weight that applied? Uh, how, how are they calculated? Uh, and that, that's really a organization or a industry specific, how much weight they apply to that particular moving average. Uh, one of the disadvantages of a weighted moving average is that it required demand history for some period of n, uh, and those periods must be carried along with the computation. And it, um, the moving average can the moving moving average cannot be changed easily without changing each of the weights. And uh, to overcome some of this anomalies associated with the moving average is where the exponential smoothing came about. And it's based on a simpler idea than the new average can be computed from the old average along with the most recent demand. And you see that over at the bottom of page 260 and 261, where they give us the, the, the formula of A subscript T equals the alpha times DT plus one minus alpha times AT minus one. And this value of this smoothing constant of 
of alpha it helps us determine how much the calculations of those weights are going to be anywhere alpha can take on any value between zero and one uh, but it's usually 0.1 to 0.2 is a good benchmark to which to start from but it can go anywhere from zero to one and to illustrate this to give us a few good illustrations at the bottom of page 260 with different values of alpha and how that calculation can can work for us and in the simple exponential smoothing uh, just as in the case of the moving average we assume that the time series uh, at the level with no cycles and no seasonal or trend components and that is from the um, f subscript t plus one equals a subscript two uh, excuse me subscript t this simple exponential formula you see in on page 261 this is the alternate formula of the first order and it's looking at the forecast of the demand time the, uh, the actual demand of that particular period in t being the the time period and again it assumes no trend no seasonality or no cycle we're adjusting we're just adjusting the forecast f of t to get f of t plus one and uh, you see that again over on page 261 where they give us that fig that uh, formula in 11.4 um, formula 11.4 on page 261 so the exponential smoothing example, they, they give us this smoothing example for the sales of 15, and we have an alpha level of 0.2, what is the forecast of October. So we're looking at the September forecast of 15 plus the alpha level times the September actual minus the September forecast. So we have the September forecast of being 15, we have the September actual being 13. So you can see how the math is being calculated for the forecast for October of 14.6. So uh, be comfortable in uh, working these from a mathematical standpoint. And if, you, if it's been a while since you've done some of the algebra, brushing up on some of the algebra may be a good exercise for you. So, and again, you see that on page 260, 261, they give us a data table very similar to what we had uh, in table 11.3, but now we have a data table in 11.4, which adds, which adds this concept with the alpha level of 0.1 and an alpha level of 0.3 as we're looking at how this is math is being calculated and in in 262 you see in table 11.4 uh, both methods have the positive bias with the alpha of 0.1 uh, producing more bias than an alpha level 0.3 and the second measure forecast is the absolute standard deviation which is the MAD value that you see of alpha equal 0.3. Forecast accuracy and forecast errors. Uh, as we're looking and thinking about forecasting errors, it's about how can we compute along with the smoothing average that gives us the greatest accuracy. There are several ways to do that that you see listed here and on page 260. Three to monitor the, monitor the erratic, excuse me, monitor erratic demand observations or outliers, which determine when the forecasting method is no longer tracking actual demand. Determine the parameter values, set safety stocks or safety capacity, thereby to ensure that we have a level of protection against stockouts. Several of these will be covered in subsequent chapters. Uh, but that just gets you exposed to it in this particular chapter. And you see on the bottom of page 263 where we have the cumulative sum of forecast errors, the mean square error, the mean absolute 
the mean absolute deviation of the forecast error and the mean absolute percentage errors. And these are four ways to measure the long-term uh, run forecast accuracy over several periods, which is part of the forecasting accuracy. This particular time series data is figure 11.3 back over on page 262, which just takes the plotting of the information over specific time periods, just a graphical representation. So the forecasting error, again, on page 263, these are the four different ways to measure the long-term, um, these are the ways in which to monitor the long-term accuracy as we make forecasting in the future. Uh, the forecasting accuracy formulas, again, there at the bottom of page 263, just to re reiterate those to you. Uh, when you think about the advanced, uh, excuse me, when you think about this tracking signal, which is this one at the bottom of page 264, as we're looking at whether the forecast is tracking with the actual time series values and to determine this, but they come up with this tracking signal that's computed by TS equals CFE divided by MAD at some time period. And CFE is the cumulative sum of errors divided by the mean absolute deviation at some time period to give us the cumulative forecasting. And in this, um, when we're doing that, we're looking at the control limits of plus and minus six standard deviations, which is, um, as you know, if, if the mean is in the center, three deviations to the left, three deviations to the right, but that you're looking at plus and minus within those control limits, plus and minus six on the tracking signal to ensure only a 3% probability that the uh, limits will be exceeded by chance. And again, we see that at the bottom of page 264. Now we get into time series forecasting, which is an adaptive way of looking at exponential smoothing. And it's uh, using a smoothing coefficient of alpha, which is going to vary. And it has a mathematical model that we're going to use in the, using the Box Jenkins methods. Over on page 266, we see table 11.5 which kind of gives us the time series forecasting methods, their uses and their accuracies, and at, at um, what type of description or method that's going to be utilized. The casual forecasting methods over on page 267, uh, if you recall from that, that's really looking at the regressions model and in that regression model of y prime equals a plus bx, which we can use as the uh, single variable of the linear model, very good use for making predictions. It is one of those things that, that you should have learned or been exposed to when you were taking statistics, where y prime is the estimated demand, x is the independent variable, a is the y-intercept, and b is the slope. And you see that discussion at uh, page 267, which is used again to uh, aid in making predictions when it comes to linear regression forecasting. Here's an example of using that particular method at table 11.6 using the regression uh, example. Uh, selecting a forecasting method, which one is going to be the best to use? Uh, table 11.7 on page 269 gives you a forecasting method. What are the methods, their method, their uses, accuracy, and when would they, when would they be used the best? Uh, so it kind of goes, it gives us that great data table to use it. How sophisticated? Um, and what's the type of system that managers are going to be using. It's really going to depend on the organization, 
what are they trying to um, to forecast, what is going to be the time and resources available to make those forecasts. Uh, this is page 268, 270, 271. What's going to be the decision characteristics or what's going to be the decision that's needs to going to be made in order to make those forecasting? What data that's going to be available to you? What's the data pattern that you're going to be using in order to make those type of decisions? In this collaborative planning, forecasting, and replenishment, the CPFR is an approach aimed at achieving more accurate uh, forecast. And the, some of the important points to remember about this particular forecasting and replenishment model is at the bottom of page 273, where all parties got to be willing to share their sensitive information, which may include demand, future sales, promotion, potential orders, new products, and lead times, and so forth. Got to develop a long-term collaborative relationship that is mutually beneficial and sufficient time and resources is going to have to be developed and, and provided to ensure that this CPFR is going to succeed. And that concludes this particular chapter on chapter 11. Thank you again for watching this video.